laufen. Alles klar. Okay, so in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the actual observations of the cosmic microwave background. And the first observation, of course, that's the discovery, took place in the early 60s. And the discovery as such was really a very, very delicate story. I don't want to retell it all, but believe me, you can Google it. You will find interesting details about this. Google, for example, pigeons in cosmic microwave background, and you'll get lots of interesting material to read. Anyway, so the discovery was done in a, a way that uh, it was not as a, predicted, a prediction that people started observing and searching for the cosmic microwave background, but in fact, the idea was first to use a radio antenna, which is uh, actually a non-scientific instrument. This was an antenna which was uh, maintained by the Bell Laboratories, which were um, one of the most important drivers of telecommunication in the United States at the time. And the so-called Holmdale antenna was operated um, at those times by the two um, um, Bell uh, people, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. And they were observing, uh, actually, um, the radio emission coming from the galaxy. And uh, they found out that there's an excess noise, which they couldn't understand when they were observing the sky at uh, 7.5 centimeter wavelength. Now, the story got a bit more interesting at the time when they contacted people from the, from the Princeton Institute and specifically Dickey was uh, immediately aware of what the implications are of this result because the group at Princeton actually had been thinking about making an instrument or searching for this uh, relic radiation from the hot Big Bang that was already or had been predicted at the time by Gamow and independently by Alpha and Herman at 40 and 48. So this prediction, however, was never taken really seriously, at least it was not followed up observationally. And as a matter of fact, then Penzias and Wilson found this radiation without even looking for it. And uh, this was a fantastic observation because it really changed the landscape, literally. And uh, to demonstrate you that, I, give, I brought you here two plots, which um, uh, basically summarize the situation before and after the discovery. So on the left side, you see a plot which came out in February 1965 before the result of Pizzeis and Wilson came through. And this was sort of a summary uh, which was put together and it shows the various uh, emission which is available and which has been detected. Uh, that is, for example, you find uh, radio galaxy emission at about 100 megahertz. Uh, you find uh, upper limits on the night sky light. You find some uh, energy ranges which are probed indirectly by, for example, the photopion production of ultra energy cosmic rays, which had been known at the time. And then uh, you see this uh, triangular shaped block, which is sort of what could you what you could fit in as an emission uh, that could come from the initial hot Big Bang. And just adding the one data point by Penzias at Wilson, seven and a half centimeters, that's this one point here, which you see, um, that basically changed the whole story. And you could then fit uh, a thermal black body radiation, uh, which had a temperature of 3.5 Kelvin to this figure. And you basically, could interpret this as a thermal radiation, even though you were missing out all the spectrum. You were basically just observing one single point. But nevertheless, it really changed the picture considerably, as you can see here. The discovery um, was uh, triggering then lots of follow-up observations, efforts to try to measure the temperature also as it is distributed in the sky, so to see whether this background radiation field is actually isotropic, and there were already predictions out that you could see some large-scale deviations like a dipole component, etc. And this was basically driven, however, by observations which were uh, by, done by ground-based instruments. And there were also some observations by rockets which would go at higher atmosphere so that you could also observe at uh, 100 gigahertz frequencies. However, um, the first satellite mission was really important to fill the gaps of what had not been known at the time. So the um, experiment that came out uh, in the 80s, end of the 80s, uh, is the COBE satellite. COBE stands for Cosmic Background Explorer, and it had to be actually downscaled because at the original time of flight that it was foreseen to be launched in 1986 with the space shuttle had to be delayed and scrapped because of the, uh, the Challenger catastrophe. And uh, the launch was postponed until 89, and since there was another launch vehicle then booked, it also had to be downscaled in order to fit the, uh, the, the, the lifting capacity. 
So the Kobe satellite, here's an artist depiction, um, uh, was in a near-Earth orbit, um, so at a 900 kilometer orbit, as a matter of fact. And it consists out of the standard sort of platform a module that is, uh, you have to have sensors, you have to have uh, solar panels, you have to have communication. And the scientific instrument was um, located above this heat shield. So this heat shield would basically make sure that there was no heat radiation coming from the Earth that would then basically be detected also by the instruments which was looking for the cosmic microwave background or trying to measure it in a, in a broader band and with more details. So um, the main instruments which were related to the cosmic microwave background were the, the Firus horn antenna, which was up here, and the, um, uh, the so-called DMR antenna, which are these uh, antenna which are located here in 120 degrees separation. And these had then a uh, horn antenna, which were basically looking at the emission coming from the sky. So the whole instrument was spinning, was turning, and so this way it would scan the entire sky. So each of these horn antenna would basically cover a seven degree field of view. Now let's have a look at uh, the, the two instruments in a little bit more detail. So I'm not going to be covering here the Derby. The Derby was at a longer, uh, at, a, at a, um, a higher frequency. It was meant to, to measure essentially um, higher frequency, like one to ten micron uh, emission. Anyway, so so the which is not related to the CMB. That's why I'm going to skipping it here. It's interesting, it's the very interesting results also obtained with the DRB, but they're not of our concern here. So let's talk about the virus. The virus was the one which was based uh, was basically meant to measure the energy spectrum. That is um, to to see w to which extent the uh, radiation actually follows the black body spectrum. So if you, if you remind yourself, so before is essentially you had only a few data points from the ground which were covering this part of the black body spectrum. And now with the virus, uh, the actual measurement would be at the peak of this spectrum. So basically the peak would be covered and therefore the spectral measurement can also tell us about any deviations from the actual um, uh, thermal shape that is expected for a very, you know, uh, like a black body, ideal black body spectrum which implies that the universe was in a very good state, uh, in a very good thermal equilibrium in the early times. Now, here's the Firus instrument. So I've got this beautiful picture, which basically summarizes the actual instrument in a very, very simple way. Keep in mind, um, this is just a conceptual plot. We will have a look at the actual instrument, what it looked like in, in just in a moment. So the idea here is to basically measure the um, emission from the sky, um, and compare it with an sort of ideal black body that you could create in the spacecraft. And so the sky emission is picked up with a horn antenna. So horn antenna basically uh, leads to a um, coverage of the sky of emission to within a few degrees. And it would be pointing in, in various positions in the sky. And uh, basically the, the data that's been analyzed was always located in a region where you're not uh, getting additional radiation from foreground, like in the galaxy, etc. Now that emission would be then reflected, and you know there's lots of beam forming required, and also uh, the, the polarization filters have been involved, which are skipped here. So there's just the essentials, which basically give you the idea how this instrument would work, because it's not like a spectrometer that um, is, is sort of common, like you know, like with a grating or it's some kind of dispersion element, as uh, such. But here the the spectral measurement is performed by um, making an interferometric measurement. So uh, the beam is split, and there would be two movable mirrors, and the output ports of this, of the, um, uh, and there would be a second input uh, to, to this interferometer, which is a reference input black, black body, an internal one. There's also the possibility to put a movable black calibrator in front of the horn. So instead of looking then at the night sky or at the sky, you would basically have a temperature controlled uh, calibrator that uh, would basically help. Uh, to calibrate the whole setup. And then the radiation is, uh, you know, split through a beam splitter, uh, reflected, and the mirrors basically are movable, so the path length can be adjusted, can be changed. Also, the temperature of the reference input black body can be changed. And so uh, the data would then be essentially scans running the movable mirrors uh, through uh, various positions, basically changing the position uh, so that the path length changes by up to about six centimeters. And uh, the PI of this instrument was John Mather, and he, he got the Nobel Award for that. Uh, the same with the uh, PI of the uh, DMR, um, Smooth. 
And you see, the the, 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 the the trick about this is that you don't measure actually the frequency, but you measure the spatial variation, which is this uh, fringes that you pick up in, in an interferometer. So the interferometer output, I call it EI plus and I minus, because you've got two sets of detectors here. Actually, there's two sets of two detectors each, because you also would measure the two polarizations. And uh, so depending upon which port you would be looking at, you would be measure either plus or minus cosine two pi nu x. So that's the modulation that you get by changing the path of the length between the two um, uh, systems by uh, x centimeters. And note nu is measured here essentially as a wave uh, uh, number. So this is essentially one over the, the wavelength. And uh, then you would have here the sum of the two input ports. Uh, so you've got the uh, one port which is coming from the sky and the second port is the port which comes from the uh, reference black body. And you would overlay them and then you would get a sort of a pattern of fringes, which uh, you know one is the plus, plus sign and one is the negative sign, and whether you're basically on the um, um, on the bright and on the dark port. So you have either positive interference or negative interference on these two ports. Now the resolution that you can achieve in this uh, case is uh, limited by the maximum distance over which you drive this interferometer. That's given here. So basically with 5.85 centimeters, you get a, a resolution which is constantly like uh, quite quite small and quite good in this sense. Now, this is actually what the instrument looks like. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but you basically recognize the main components. These are the movable mirrors. This is the internal calibration source. This is the sky horn. Then you've got lots of uh, mirrors happening here. Uh, here are the two um, um, uh, beam splitters, A and B. And you've got the set of detectors. So you got the lower right and the higher right detector, which basically see the, the two um, polarization states. You've got also the left, lower left and higher left, which measure again the polarization. So these are the detectors. And in between, you've got uh, mirrors, which sort of focus and beam shape the whole setup so that you can get good fringes. And this is actually then what you would measure. So you would measure essentially one sweep. Uh, in this case, the sample basically indicates in which spacing you would be basically measuring this with the with the detectors, and uh, the counts is the intensity that you pick up. And you see that in this case, when the um, calibration black body is um, 10 millikelvin warmer than the actual sky black body, you see then this interference pattern at a particular sample distance, which tells you where the maximum deviation is in terms of frequency. And this can be then used to reconstruct to which extent the observed spectrum follows a black body spectrum. And here's the result. So this is sort of the popular view of it, which has always been shown to highlight how fantastic the instrument actually performed, even though um, th there's been some, some things which actually John Mather pointed out could be improved. And as a matter of fact, this measurement is still the best measurement that exists. So keep in mind, this is something which is done in the late 80s, and it's still there's nothing which supersedes this measurement. So that's why I'm paying a little attention to this here. So now what's plotted here is on the one side, on the y-axis is the intensity. So that's uh, now in units of Jansky. So Jansky is a unit of power received per um, uh, per surface area. Um, never mind the actual units. This is black body units. So if you now plot this uh, uh, intensity for a black body which has a temperature of 2.725 Kelvin, so note you get down to a millikelvin accuracy in the spectrum, you basically get this black line. Um, and plotted on the x-axis is the uh, fre frequency in units of inverse centimeters. So basically 10 inverse centimeters corresponds to a wavelength of one millimeter. And so the wavelength goes from right to left. So this is the high frequency, low, small wavelength stuff. And to the left, the peak is at about two millimeters of the CMB spectrum. And these error bars here now basically give you the uh, individual measurements with the um, proper resolution that is this is how the spectral spacing is given that you uh, sample this interference pa patterns with a uh, certain resolution. And this is then the deviation from the black body spectrum that you measure. And the arrow bars actually are, are very much overemphasized. So they basically uh, are multiplied by a factor of 400. So the actual uncertainty is much, much smaller on the intensity. Another way of plotting this is looking at the temperature deviation as a function of the frequency. So this is sort of the same thing. A pure black body would be then the dash lines with a temperature 2.726 Kelvin. And you see that there's little deviations at the level of a fraction of a millikelvin um, that uh, can be seen, but they're statistically not very significant. So um, this fantastic measurement basically demonstrates that we have both a measurement of the temperature of the black body, 
and it's confirmed with a very high precision that the black body is indeed a black body without any deviations that can be detected with the resolution of this instrument. And as I said, this is until today the best measurement there is, and uh, there is good hope that maybe some improved um, type of spectrometer can be flown in the future, because it is quite important to understand whether there exists, because there are at some level expected deviations from thermal equilibrium would deform, or secondary effects as well, would deform this black body spectrum that we observe. And that would give us important insights into actually cosmological, um, uh, like happen, things that have happened uh, in the time of, of the CMB formation. Now the second instrument that was basically measuring the CMB is the differential microwave radiometer, so the DMR. Uh, the the uh, PI of this instrument was George Smoot. Uh, he received uh, with with John Mather the Nobel Award in 2006 for, for the combined measurement. Now this instrument basically um, is now doing something else. So while the virus was mainly aiming at measuring the temperature and the spectrum, uh, the DMR is now trying to capture deviations from the temperature in various directions. So the um, approach that, that they chose was a so-called switching radiometer. That is, you would have two um, antenna which would be looking at different parts in the sky and you would switch back and forth uh, the signal received and then measure it in your, in your setup. And this way you could then uh, construct a system where you would basically measure the difference between the two powers received. So there's no way of measuring the absolute power, you just measure the difference between the two powers. Essentially you would measure the temperature difference between two points this way. And by sweeping this instrument over the entire sky and taking a long time measurement, one could basically measure the, the uh, d distribution of intensity in the sky. Now this is again the simplified version of this thing. So there would be two horn antenna. So there's two uh, sort of receive uh, antenna uh, signals which are fed to the system. And um, essentially each one of them would be read out uh, in the same way. Uh, so there would be a, a frequency converter, so that's connected to a local oscillator, so that would be like 33 and 90 something gigahertz, that's the frequency at which this operated. And by doing this uh, mixing, you would basically transfer the high frequency signal uh, to a low frequency signal with a certain bandwidth, which would be about a gigahertz or even less, I think it's a few hundred megahertz, I don't remember exactly. Then the signal would be amplified after you keep bring it down to a smaller frequency. And then, um, since the signal is oscillating as an average of zero, you need diode detectors. This is something like a square type detector. So you would basically only measure the positive fluctuations of this. And then uh, you would have a modul demodulator switch where you would basically take into account that you measure with 100 uh, hertz back and forth. You would demodulate the sum of the two signals and then you would get something which is then um, the, the m measure of the difference between the two uh, antennas signal. And here again, this is the, the sort of detailed uh, view of this thing. Uh, so sort of the same thing I was just implying. You had this uh, for the two channels. There was This is the switch, which was basically working on the two channels. And in the end, you had a lock and amplifier, which would pick out the signal coming from the switching frequency. Now, which frequency is, of course, the frequency of the radio emission that is picked up is chosen at something like 90 gigahertz, because, or between 60 and 90 gigahertz, because that's where you would basically expect the largest uh, uh, signal coming from the sky in terms of comparing it to the fluctuation of the foreground. That is, there's foreground emission coming from our galaxy, notably uh, synchrotron emission from the energetic electrons in our galaxy, which dominates the low frequency part, and at higher frequency you would have dust emission, which would dominate then over the fluctuations of the of the CMB. So this is sort of a picture which tells you what the antenna temperature fluctuations are as a function of frequency. So CMB anisotropy would basically follow this kind of shape, and uh, the uh, the low part would be synchrotron emission, the low frequency part, and the high part would be the dust. So there's sort of like a sweet spot uh, up to about 100 gigahertz, where most of the fluctuations are really coming from uh, the CMB. Um, on the cosmic microwave background. So these were the results that uh, came out the first year of data uh, that was presented by Smoot in 1992. And uh, you see now this is the 90 gigahertz signal. So at 90 gigahertz you basically see the um, components coming from the CMB as well as the dust emission from the galaxy. So the dust emission is quite prominent here. You see it and you also see it at 53 gigahertz. You also see it at 31 gigahertz. Uh, however, this is then uh, basically coming from the um, uh, 
uh, from the from the synchrotron emission, whereas this part at 90 gigahertz is mainly coming from the um, from the dust emission. And in between, you basically see sort of the mixture of the two. But in any case, you always have this strong foreground emission from the galaxy, and you see some fluctuations at high galactic and low galactic latitudes away from the galaxy, which are usually uh, um, coming from from uh, the um, from the actual CMB. Now, um, one way of taking care of this is basically subtracting out the foreground emission that has been done here. Um, and what you see then is that uh, at 1953 and 31 gigahertz, you see essentially something which is pretty much isotropic. I should also point out that there's a dipole emission which has been taken out because there's, of course, the motion of the Earth in, in, within the CMB background, which leads to a, a dipole anisotropy. So this is already subtracted out. And then you basically are left with small fluctuations um, in, uh, in the emission, which cannot be resolved because keep in mind, there's like a seven degree uh, big beams that are recorded with the DMR. And this is about the size of these spots here. So the actual anisotropy is probably smaller in angular scale, or you, know, you could imagine it's smaller, but it cannot be resolved out because the, the beam size is just too large. And so, however, something that was noted already quite quickly or immediately after this this uh, discovery, because this was the first time this anisotropy was discovered, um, is that the fluctuations are quite small. So they're at the level of, I put the number somewhere up here, the average, uh, the, the RMS value is something like 10 to the minus 5 Kelvin, so 10 micro Kelvin. That means, uh, sorry, 10, 10, um, 10 times 10 to the minus 5, and that if, uh, if, you, if you take the average temperature to be 2.73 Kelvin, that would be something like 30 or so micro Kelvin. So that's actually very small, as it turns out, and we will discuss that in the next lecture, why this is so, why, why this is surprising, but it was quite clear to the people who were interpreting the data, and one of the first interpretation papers came out already, and uh, sort of back to back with this DMR paper in 1992, I realized that you need something like dark matter, which uh, would lead to structure formation already at a time of about one second after the Big Bang, well before the CMB actually was formed at a time of 300,000 uh, years after the, the uh, Big Bang. Now let's, let's move ahead, because this was not the end in terms of detection technique. While the virus, uh, virus result cannot be much, it's not easy to, to, to top that because it's already uh, quite sensitive and it's uh, got a beautiful spectral shape. It's not easy to um, compete with. However, the angular resolution of, of the DMR, which is limited by the um, angular aperture of these uh, horn antenna, can be of course improved. And also something that can be improved is to add uh, uh, some, some light collection area to basically increase the signal to noise. And uh, that's been done uh, in the meantime. So as usual for uh, space faring missions, it takes about 20 years to set them up. And uh, the first one who, which came up and is taking, was taking data was about, um, well, not 20 years after Kobe, as a matter of fact, actually more, a little bit more than 10 years after Kobe already, so that's quite quick. Uh, and that was the W map. That's a NASA mission which flew between 2001 and it was taking data until 2010. And W map stands for Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. And before we look at the beautiful maps, let's have a look at the instrument. So the instrument consists out of, you know, essentially it's the same as the COBE uh, or the DMR. It has two sets of um, instruments which would look back to back at two patches in the sky. And the, the actual emission is collected with two um, reflectors, which basically um, reflect the emission into horn antenna system. And there's several wavelength bands covered. So there's um, K, K alpha, Q1, Q2, V1, V2, W1 to W4. These are the different bands, and I can maybe scroll back so that I can show you. These correspond to these uh, wavelength bands which were covered here. So the W and the V band, for example, are the ones which are of prime importance, whereas K and KR, they are, they are bands which basically uh, would pick up mostly the synchrotron emission from the galaxy. However, it turns out this is important to subtract that emission even at higher frequencies. Okay. So um, you can imagine already from this picture that this is a much more complex type of instrument. However, the way it operates is very, very similar. So you, in this case, um, you have uh, the two back-to-back -back emissions. They are being switched, again, in the same way as a Dicky radiometer. 
switching radiometer. So here you basically see this uh, situation as it is uh, uh, realized in the optical setup. So on the A and the B side, uh, you have to have the same set of instruments. There would be the prim primary mirrors, which is the 1.4 times 1.6 mirror. Um, and it uh, collects the light into a secondary optics, which then uh, brings it into the, um, the, the horn antenna. And then you would basically have a similar type of, of readout chain as before. So there would be a switching done between the two. And you would see then um, that one of the difference here is that everything is cooled. So um, the temperature is, is uh, both of the optics is passively cooled to be less than 90K. And the setup down here is cooled to uh, something above, slightly above liquid helium temperature to reduce the noise. And after the, um, after the um, amplification with using cold amplifiers, uh, the rest of the optics would be, uh, and the signal processing would take place in the warm because the signal to noise has been improved already and there's not much noise coming, so the noise figure is essentially uh, quite small. Now, um, this setup also to reduce uh, the stray thermal emission from Earth uh, has also a heat shield. Remember, the, there was a cone type heat shield for the COBE. Uh, this heat shield is m much larger. And in order to, to reduce also the, the thermal emission, this mission was not flying in a near-Earth orbit, let's say at 700 kilometers above Earth, but it was launched on a, a longer transit mission, uh, Transluna, to a Lagrange point. So let me just briefly mention how here this, this orbital mechanics works. So, so uh, Earth and Sun uh, basically produce a system when the Earth is moving around the Sun, where you have several Lagrange points and the Lagrange points are essentially saddle points where basically uh, a probe would be force free. However, the system is unstable against any kind of perturbation. So basically, once it drifts away from that saddle point or from that maximum, that's actually a maximum L4 and L5, it would basically uh, not come back unless you steer it back actively. And uh, there's a Lagrange point just behind the uh, uh, moon system, L2, and that would be like a saddle point. So that will be stable against uh, movement in this direction. And in this direction, it needs to be stabilized by actively keeping it there. Uh, so the Lagrange point 2 has the big advantages against the L1 point, which is on this solar side, uh, that there you would have the radiation shielding from this shadow, which the Earth casts. And therefore, the system is basically uh, not seeing much emission from the sun. Um, it basically gets um, also some um, because of the distance to the Earth, it can be sh the Earth sh uh, radiation can be shielded quite effectively. Now, there's however one disadvantage. I should mention that because of the uh, uh, the, the probe being outside the magnetosphere or the, the, the yeah the magnetosphere of, of Earth, um, it's not shielded against cosmic radiation. So cosmic radiation basically causes some additional trouble out there. Um, so, so this thing has then, in the end, um, it, the op frequencies in which it operates from 22 to 9 gigahertz, a much better beam size. So basically, instead of 7 degrees, even at the lowest frequency, we are talking about 0.93 um, degrees. And that's been improved to less than 0.2 degrees at 90 gigahertz. So 0.2 degrees would be about 7 arc minutes um, in, in size. Um, and that's, that's uh, quite a substantial improvement with respect to the result that was obtained with the, uh, with the DMR. And these are the maps. So you see clearly, these are temperature maps now, um, and you see again clearly that there's um, foreground emission coming from the galaxy. So this has now been uh, plotted in a slightly different way. So this is in, I think, equatorial coordinates. So that means that the galaxy runs around this uh, equator, not around the equator of, the, uh, of this projection. And you clearly see that uh, there's the, the very strong component. Um, oh, actually, I should say this is actually not WMAP. This is Planck. I, I should point that out here. So this is actually the Planck result. But similarly, you can obtain some of the uh, frequency bands with uh, WMAP. And um, finally, let's talk about the last mission I just want to mention here briefly. So the Planck mission uh, is a European uh, mission which um, differs quite a lot from the WMAP. Uh, first of all, there's only one set of instruments, and uh, there's no switching involved. However, there's duplicate instruments in the, in the prime focal. So if you look at the focal plane, you can see this actual picture. This is the uh, primary mirror, and the secondary optics would be down here. I think it's not in place in this in this uh, setup. 
and you see all these little horns down here that's the, essentially the the um, vocal instruments and there's always two instruments operating so basically for 44 gigahertz you have two of them so basically when the telescope turns the two instruments will always see um, the same patch in the sky slightly later because of this it all rotates with about one rotation per second uh, so there's essentially a scanning instead of a switching otherwise all the things are similar except for that this has a much larger range uh, of frequencies that's covered so basically it goes up to 857 gigahertz and uh, that frequency a radiometer does not really work anymore because it's not possible to measure the um, the uh, the actual voltage anymore so instead um, you need something where you measure the uh, the the radiation a different way and that's done in a so-called bolometric uh, way so um, it's sort of detecting uh, photons almost in a way and there's two sets of um, uh, instruments on board so the low frequency instruments which are classical radiometers they're operating with a cryo cola at something like 20 kelvin temperature and they have an angular resolution which is about similar to the w map uh, so 33 arc minutes to 14 arc minutes so the lowest frequency starts with 33 arc minutes and that's uh, still better than the um uh, than the w map which has um a slightly larger beam size and um it goes up to 14 arc minutes and then finally uh, the high frequency instruments uh, they need to be cooled even more so they are cooled to uh, millikelvin temperatures and that's very very difficult to do uh, not even on a laboratory on earth uh, in space it's it's really a complex uh, system that you need to implement um, and so in, in, this is working using a dilution type refrigerator where you use the entropy when you mix um, different helium helium 3 and helium 4 and uh, this brings down the temperature ultimately to something like a few millikelvin in which you can operate these polometers uh, with a very low noise uh, level and uh, the angular resolution there is then a fantastic 10 arc minutes 5 arc minutes and that's also what you see here for example the mirror has to be almost like an optical mirror because the wavelength is so short now these are the results that can be obtained with the w map so i was telling you you can see uh, the beautiful dust emission you can also see polarization so it's a beautiful instrument which was taking uh, data and i just want to give you here some sort of a hint on how this has been evolving over time so if you go back to the time when uh, that the first measure was taken you had no idea what the distribution of, of uh, the intensity of the cmb would be in the sky and with w map it was f with kobe you would first time see some fluctuations you couldn't resolve them out and if you look at the sky with w map you see that there is actually now a, a structure visible that is um, on a particular angular scale resolvable and with Planck mission you can basically uh, even resolve out finer structures but um, and, and also with with uh, with a better precision so this is really giving us a bit a much better measurement of this anisotropy pattern in the sky and in the coming lecture we will discuss the implications of these measurements and what can be inferred from that